So this is, is there a too selfish? Um, what is a balanced selfish? Why does selfish not lead into social isolation or can it? But this like, is the kind of question, I like the question because it's the kind of question I think so many people who started in objectivism yeah. think about and, 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 and struggle with and try to figure out. Um, I think I wrote a lot about it, but, but it's, and it's not, it's not self-evident and, but it has a whole, it, and it has a whole psychological dimension to it. Right? Yeah. So I'm sure you're on, you could do a great job of answering this question, at least, you know, in the philosophical. Now we, now we want more answers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I'll give you my psychologically oriented kind of spin on it. So if we understand Rand's concept of selfishness and its full radicalness, and it's hard to, because it's so radical. It's so not like any of the other ideas that are out there, that it's really hard to just f fully extrapolate, kind of to isolate it from what most people mean by these various words. So if we really understand what she means by selfishness, then being too selfish is like being too good or too alive, right? And people might say that because they have sloppy, definitions of those concepts, right? But what she means by selfish is actually, actually kind of conceptualizing and acting upon the things that are going to give you the best life, right? Living the best life that you can by using your mind to the fullest to figure out what is going to give you the greatest, most integrated, most joyful, most spiritually fulfilling experience in life. If you take that seriously, if you really internalize what that means, and you also remember that she thought other human beings are among our greatest values, then there's no way anymore that you could interpret selfishness as somehow implying isolation or distancing from other people or rudeness or disregard for other people because why would you be rude and disregarding of one of your top values how is that selfish that doesn't make any sense so now, why, why are people, other people such a high value to you and maybe focus i mean it's it's kind of obvious maybe in the economic sense but why in the psychological sense in the in the in the you know more personal sense yeah so I gave a talk on this over summer in case anyone wants to go visit on YouTube? Uh, that YouTube. It is on YouTube, Deeper Connection Through Mutual Selfishness. Good. I guess might as well make that plug. Cool. But, but to give you a brief synopsis of that aspect. So spiritually, this is one of the contributions that Rand made, certainly to my psychological development, was identifying and really concretizing this, that the kind of spiritual fulfillment and joy and fuel that we get from admiring other people who are living our values and also from the visibility that we get from other people who get us, being able to both see our values made visible, you know, see that passion, that ambition, that deep devotion to a goal or to a person for that matter that we can resonate with and that we can see that it's worth the struggle just as it was worth the struggle for them that we can, you know, feel the pathos that they're feeling and thereby sort of expand our, the range of our own emotional existence by investing energy and, and meaning that's probably, you know, putting it too kind of in too modern a way, but by, I mean, I really like actually this modern conception of the extended self. There's a certain way in which, you know, I'm sure it gets used in bad ways as well as good, but there's a, a way it's get, that I've seen it used that I actually really like where the things you own are part of your extended self. It's like, they're part of you now. You've invested in them and you've, you're counting on them, you know, to be there just, so this is, closer to the economic argument for why property rights are important, right? And then also they're there, they're part of you in the spiritual way that just as, you know, things that are dear and near and dear to you 
mean more and you have attachment to them and feelings about them and you want to protect them from getting hurt, that that's true in spades of other people that you value. That because these are other consciousnesses, you know, that have their own lives and experiences and joys and sorrows and pursuits that you can understand and care about and that you're now also invested in and have a stake, that, that it's sort of like it expands our scope. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, there are obvious ways that that's true economically through division of labor and such. But the spiritual analog of that, I think, is as or even more potent in terms of how it affects our experience of life, that the more your universe is peopled by other human beings who enrich and who kind of emphasize different dimensions and aspects of you, who, with whom you can connect and relate on different values, with whom you can experience parts of yourself being, you know, brought out and expressed. Like, you know, this is the friend with whom I just always kind of horse around and we have a silly good time and, and I'm able to experience that joyful, bubbly aspect, you know, of how I see the world. And it's wonderful. And I don't really get that if I'm just by myself or if I'm with another of my friends who's really serious all the time, you know, and that gives me some, that gives me a deep kind of solemn. To, I mean, it, this is like what we were saying about art to the extent that we have these fictionalized models, how much better to have real life ones, you know, that do struggle and suffer and have, you know, in our flesh and blood. And, and there's also a certain visibility you get from right. those other people, right? And that's the second, yeah. It's the second big way that, that people bring value. Is, Talk a little bit about that, what that visibility means. Yeah, so, uh, so I would say this is one of our basic needs, just as much as, self-esteem, I mean, it's more downstream kind of logically and maybe when, I don't even know if chronologically, it might be one of, might be simultaneous with self-esteem, but in any case, visibility or the experience of another mind understanding and resonating with and admiring, giving sanction to what makes us good, you know, the things that we care about, our virtues, our achievements, our, our struggles, is a fundamental psychological need. And, you know, in Atlas, when Dagny is in the Gulch and when, is it Hugh Axton or is it Mulligan, but the one who says to her, well done. And it's just, I, I've never not cried reading that scene, you know, which tells you about, you know, I'm still catching up on my visibility needs, whatever. But it's a really fundamental human need, partly because it's well nigh impossible for us to see ourselves in the third person. Yep. It's really, really hard. And there are ways that we can try to get around that and compensate for it by watching ourselves on tape, which is horrible, you know, for a lot of the very same reasons, or by trying to picture what would a friend say about this, you know, trying to like model it mentally. But nothing, none of that even comes close to the actual corporeal presence of another, or it doesn't have to be physically corporeal, you know, but the, the, external reality of another human being with a separate mind from ours who's able to look back at us and see in us from their perspective you know what we value in ourselves yep. Yep. so there's a lot more i could say but but it's it's a basic need and there's not enough said about it so and i think i think particularly the first aspect of this is is what makes art so powerful and so much of a need because again it's another way in which we get visibility into you know you know deep virtue deep, you know the, the important virtues the important values that, that we have to pursue in order to live yeah though again there's that's no substitute for actual people absolutely, absolutely. and that's an important absolutely. Point to emphasize yeah i mean there are too many people who use objectivism as an excuse to shun other people uh, we were talking a little bit before I, I told you about men. What, what was it? I forget now what it's called. Men on their own. And going on their own, their own uh, way. Like, oh, something like that. Oh, yeah, their own way. What? It's an excuse, it's an excuse to, yeah. to, to, to isolate themselves and to not engage in exactly these amazing experiences that one can only have, only have with other people. That you just cannot have these experiences otherwise. All right, here's...